How's everybody doing today? Good? Good. Uh, I'm Brandon Bro. Hi. I'm Brandon. Uh, I'm from Chicago, born and raised. I was born on the south side, like Chatham, Grand Crossing area. Um, went to Peary and Dixon Elementary School. Uh, from there, I went to Chicago High School for Agricultural Sciences High School. And then I went to, of course, here, I came here to DePaul. Well, actually, first I went to, to um, Alabama A&M, and then I came to DePaul. And um, I'm still paying my student loans. <laughs> and uh, actually, the fee that I'm like, charging for this talk is going to Sally Mae, to be honest. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, so yeah, I'm from Chicago, born and raised. And um, I've just been kind of like heavily involved in culture throughout the course of my artistic practice. And I guess it, part of it was like design as well, you know, because there was a certain point in my life where the people in the, around me were telling me uh, worry, right? And they were telling me like, okay, our thing is cool, but you need to get into computers. And that's how they would say it because like no one knew what exactly I would do in computers or whatever. But it was, um, they were pretty much saying that like, you know, technology is taking off and you need to position yourself and anchor yourself somewhere in a technological like, field, right? Like we hear about starving artists every day. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of artists hear when they want to create what they're doing. But I'm glad my family did that because it gave me a lot of the tools that allows me to step and be in the spaces that I'm in today. So like, I'm very grateful. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about like, my story, my personal story. It's tied into my art and this duality between spirituality and like, the physical world. Right? I, feel like, um, with, I feel like design is very left brain, actually. I feel like it's very analytical. Um, and I feel like art, for me, is a very right brain type of thing. And I, I think about them in those terms. right? right? Um, my art is very much more spiritual, like aimed and focused, whereas my design is solving a problem, right? Between a client and their customer or their audience and stuff like that. So for me, um, my background has had like a huge impact in what I've experienced, the spaces I've been through. So I'm gonna give like a history story on myself real quick um, to kind of give y'all context, right? So two days before I was born, um, there was an incident in my family that happened that kind of transformed the course of our relationship with one another, right? A lot of times, like, things happen, you know, within, within family or whatnot to kind of, you know, you have to deal with some things, right? So what happened specifically was my, my father got diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. He ended up coming home one day while he was out, and he ended up killing his father. He ended up stabbing my grandfather like seven times. That is the context of the space that I was kind of born into. It's a, um, I didn't know about it until like I was 22, but it started to explain a lot when I figured out what exactly happened. So what happened was he was um, kind of experimenting with drugs, psychedelics. So he experimented with LSD. He was already experiencing some mental health issues, uh, voices and things that he was trying to seek help for at the time. But that didn't happen, and he ended up experimenting with the substance that triggered an episode. And that's what happened from the episode, right? Um, so mental health is a huge part of my practice. And the thing that I'm, I constantly focus on, it started out as a fear that I had. I was kind of growing up scared that I would sort of lose my mind, in a sense, right? Um, and that was like scarier than death, like this idea of death. Like the idea of like not knowing who you are or not knowing if the person you're talking to is real or not seems was like a lot scarier to me than uh, having to leave here. So um, it, it was something that like that was it stuck with me. It was a huge part of like my practice and oh just my peace of mind and I transformed it into part of my practice a little later and I'll talk about that. Um, beyond that, like I was in the neighborhood that I was in was. South side of Chicago, Chatham, Grand Crossing area, middle of the crack epidemic. I mean, it was, I was five years old and I, I saw my first uh, corpse right on 79th Street, outside of like, who had fell off a bench. And it was somebody who, I was with my mother's boyfriend at the time. We were walking down 79th Street. We were just walking down the street and we happened to see this, 
this guy laying in the street. And of course, he didn't tell me what was going on, but you can feel it. Like even at those young, that young age, you can feel what's going on spiritually and emotionally with people and things in your space. And it was just the strangest, oddest feeling to have at five. But I trusted what he said because, you know, going with where, where whatever would have took me was, you know, it's something else. So, you know, you trust the people around you at that age. You kind of don't have a choice. But that's the context in which um, I kind of came up. That guy was like a father figure to me who ended up passing actually when I was attending Nepal like years later. I know I'm talking about like a, a, lot, a lot of sort of kind of dark things, but I feel like um, what we do with our circumstances uh, determine our well-being, right? Like we can choose how we're relating to ourselves and our past and our history in a way that empowers us, or we can choose to do so in a way that disempowers us, right? So that's like a big thing with me. It's like, I call it alchemy. I call it like turning things into, into other things, turning coal into gold or whatever you want to say like that. That's like my spiritual or like energetic form of like alchemy is like really doing that type of stuff. So from there, I was really interested in art. As a kid, I was drawing all the time, drawing family, drawing a lot of different things, Ninja Turtles and He-Man and stuff like that. And um, I ended up getting the attention, of course, of my family and attention of like classmates talking about it all the time. I just drew all the time. And my mother finally enrolled me at some classes at the Art Institute, SAIC. Oh yeah, I was supposed to do this way earlier. So that's that stuff. That's my dad. And SAIC slide. So this was a big deal, and I didn't realize how big of a deal it was at that point in my life. I was being exposed to um, technique, and I was being exposed to language that I didn't know exist that related to what I was super fascinated about. So like, to be in a class, and I'm talking about like highlights and shadows, and how to manipulate you know, um, shapes, was incredible like, at a super young age. And I was in like what was called the early college program, so they had us in courses with adults where we were kind of learning side by side with adults. So I was doing everything. I was doing figure drawing, I was doing fashion, I was doing video, I was doing everything as much as I could and expressing myself as fully sort of as I could in that medium. Um, I wasn't exposed to poetry at the time, I kind of found that later. So like my voice was pretty much through pictures and like how I expressed myself was always through pictures. Um, uh, recently, I, I, I saw the, anybody seen the Virgil, Virgil Abloh talk? that he just did, a couple, couple people. He just did a talk, and um, one of his main themes behind the talk was pretty much be true to yourself and what you're doing. If you follow your own DNA, your own footprint with what you're doing, there's no way your work will be confused with anybody else's work and won't belong to you. And I think that's an important lesson for people to get like as creatives in the field. And I kind of like talk about that a little bit more a little later, but his target age uh, and what was going on and that point in life that you should probably be looking back to like see, you know, what were you doing at that age should probably determine like what you actually care about, what you're really passionate about. He, he defined that age around like 17. And I think it changes and I think it varies for different people. Like for me, I was really into the things that I wanted to do for the rest of my life by, by 12 or 13. It was really comic book art and sequential art, right? Around 17, I was, I was in the break dance and I was in hip hop, but I was also experiencing depression at the time. I didn't really, really understand what it was, but I was, I was, it was like, like a pretty serious uh, level, you know, episode or phase of depression. And I was seeking to find ways of expression and ways out of how I was feeling through physical means. So I was like break dancing, I was doing all these other things and none of that stuff was absolutely fulfilling um, until I got self-value and start understanding like self-worth. But anyway, um, beyond that stuff, or beyond my school or my education, I was always seeking for different things to do. So if, if I find myself in communities of people that were doing the most different shit you can imagine, like they were breakdancing in the 90s. And like for a lot of people in my neighborhood, that was the weirdest thing ever, like that is 
old. Like you weren't even, you were like a kid when that came out. You probably don't remember like why you, why you break dancing and what you're doing. But the beauty in that stuff, the beauty in culture is like magnificent. Like I don't think people get like the importance of culture in shit, in our, in our world and the things we deal with day to day. Like I constantly unveil new lever, levels of how important culture is and how powerful and impactful culture is in my life even. And I look back and I see all of the relationships I built, I started to build when I was 17. That's what led to me working with all the hip hop artists I work with. That's what directly led me to in the path that I'm, I'm going, right? And I, I just find it really interesting. And I, um, yeah, I can't, I can't really talk about it enough, you know, about um, just the importance of it, man. Hip hop culture was genius in itself. I mean, what we were doing, we were, we didn't know how to, we didn't have a teacher. We taught ourselves how to break. We ended up opening up for artists. It was like opening up for Kanye, like by the time we were 18. And these people, when they, they were like opening acts, right? Beginning acts. We did something for Daddy Yankee. That was a real weird show, but <laughs> it was tight, you know? Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we did a lot of like opening acts. We, we were, you know, in the circles with these people. And it, I like, I, I really appreciate the potential, like the power of hip hop when done I guess you could say the right way, but then who, who's to say, like, what's the right way, right? Um, but yeah, I like, attribute a lot of that stuff that end up happening for myself is directly related to culture. And not knowing that I was t partaking in culture, but just it being everywhere once, you know, I found the sites. Man, I like, I like to talk about the projects and stuff I work um, from, from the perspective of how I was kind of led to them, how I was led through the projects, and then also, like, you know, like the, the kind of logic or like the logistics behind like what made it work, you know, like, and I feel like that's sort of like the left brain side of things. But I feel like um, when you're traveling in your, in your glow or in your right path, things start to open up. And I think the trick is like, is finding that, but not trying to force it. Like I was trying to do t-shirts and a lot of things for a long time. There's nothing wrong with it, but my path differentiated. It wasn't there completely, you know what I mean? And, and it wasn't until I got I allowed what was going around me in the universe to really show me what was up and actually follow my path that a lot of more things start to open up. Um, so I just make it a point to kind of really keep my ears open and not hear what I want to hear, keep my perspective open too, and be able to see what other people see as well. Um, this is a, a quote that I pull from, of course, it's Kanye. This is a dope quote. I mean, people say like, oh, Kanye, whatever, whatever you want to say, you know? I think, you know, we find ourselves in spaces like we've, we've been sold an American dream that kind of tells you when you get certain things, you're going to feel better about yourself. Or like when you get certain degrees, certain whatever else, and you're making a certain amount of money, you're going to feel better about yourself and it's going to improve your quality of life. And that's the, like the opposite of fulfillment. Like physical, physical things can never fully fulfill the soul. I was looking at a talk not too long ago. This guy was like ragging like the millennials. He was just like kind of talking crap and he was saying how they were spoiled and they kind of, you know, they just used to getting everything they want. And I, I, I don't think that's the truth. I think y'all not dumb, y'all not spoiled and y'all are, are experiencing, me myself too, when I was in, in these agencies, experiencing a lack of passion a lack of fulfillment from the work that I was doing. And I, I think a lot of it comes from being um, brought up in a society that trains you to believe that a job or working for someone else is going to fulfill your soul. I mean, that, that's, just how, that's just how I see it, and, you know, my perspective. I mean, for some people, that's, that's their dream. They want to assist like some particular person, they want to do that, and that is completely fulfilling for them. But for me, it just wasn't, and I kept running into these hurdles in agencies, I mean, it was only like a couple of black dudes in the agency period, if any, the agencies that I was working at. And then I was dealing with my own art, my own artistic self, trying to manage what I was really feeling and why am I feeling like this, I'm making so much. But damn, I feel so great when I don't have work for a couple months. And then I start hurting, my ribs start touching, and you know, <laughs> then you start hurting. But um, you know, I, I think that, uh, we really have to start redefining it, this, this idea of what the American dream is, because I think it's expired. You know, I think it's, a, it's an old concept that we need to 
redefine for ourselves. So my work from a creative standpoint, whether I'm working for a client or I'm doing some personal work, I think storytelling is a huge aspect of the work. Being able to tell a story from start to finish. And like a lot of times, you, I mean, I'm a 2D artist, right? So I don't, I don't get to animate a lot. I mean, I could if I wanted to, but animation is just not the mode of expression I choose to uh, operate in, right? But for a 2D artist to be able to tell a story with an image, for me, you know, um, that means in some way conveying time, in some way creating an environment that's saying something. And then, of course, if you get to do things in sequences and series, then you get to tell a more elaborate, a broader story. So I don't know, this is something I, I really focus on in my work and being able to be super obvious when you're encountering the work. And, and I, I think it's like innate. I, I think I probably got it from comic books. I was into sequential art, right? And everything is a frame and it's telling a story. So I tried to make that super evident even when it came to like the first, first chance cover, like the tab on the side. I, I mean, I inspired by that straight from a comic book with like his name in the tab or whatever. So um, making those things appear in the work kind of helped me tie and draw back to those early experiences and those early interests I was speaking about a little bit earlier. Um, most of my work, my, my art, painting, fine art, relates to those concepts um, dealing with mental health. An attempt to try to define these states of mind for myself and also to spark conversation about those states of mind, people's you know, states of being. Uh, approaching figurative art, trying to convey those emotions and uh, uh, convey those voices, that's just been a device for me. That's what I've used now to kind of like express my work or kind of deal with those things. I still have a, like a, a bunch of questions and unresolved things that um, I wish I could speak to my father about and my way of kind of dealing with it is through this. And how a lot of this came about is I, uh, around the time I was in college, actually, and even a little bit before, uh, I started to experience a lot of anxiety. It was, it was like, man, it was crazy. It was like trying to fit myself and who I was into like this career called the designer, right? And I was looking through all this inspiration of other, this artist and these, what these people were doing in the world. And I was trying to like fit myself into those forms. Um, and it was great, though, because it was like, you get great inspiration, you get a lot of things from them. But I think what, um, what that caused was a lot of anxiety. I would get like flashes, like I would, you know what I mean? I would heat, like flat. it was just weird. It was really weird. So um, one of the methods, or one of the things I did to kind of deal or like cope with those things, I started drawing these characters. And these characters were to embody like ideas, were to embody like concepts or like anxiety. So I didn't have to hold on to the things in my life, right? Because I understood that when you bottle things up, they boil over, right? They turn into something else. So if I, if I didn't have a conduit and to put that expression, that emotion into, um, it would consume me. So I started doing a lot of these, these paintings with these masks and uh, these figures kind of consuming the subjects to convey those ideas and to be able to you know, talk about those things. Because I think speaking about it is very important. A lot of people with mental health issues don't actually end up getting help and end up, end up suicide, a lot of different things. I had some close people um, to me lose loved ones over you know, suicide and just crazy depression that they were dealing with. So let me go back. So I'm going to get into this work now. So this is a cover I did for a friend of mine, Hollywood Holt. Very exciting guy. I met him when I was starting to break dance like years ago. Real outgoing, crazy dude. Um, but um, anyway, he's the one that like really pushed me into doing a lot of these things. I mean, I started doing work for him as, because I was doing graphic design at the time and I was working at agencies. So I had a little bit more experience than like his other homies like doing the work. Shit. At the time, other people, other homies that were doing like design work at the time. So I just started doing stuff with him. I would just make it. And he'd be like, oh, that's fresh. <laughs> and then we use it for the album cover. Um, this was the first one we did, Hope Goes to Hollywood. All of these photos were just like photos from parties that were, that were being thrown at the time. And the photographer of a lot of these original photos that I like, took these references from was a guy named Clayton Hawk, who ran a blog called Everybody is Famous. And back in the day, it was like the, the party blog. Like if you wanted to see party images, uh, like the night before, whatever, you go there and just look, look at all the images and everybody of everybody. It's really cool, um, which I feel like the concept of Superfund almost kind of like evolved 
from what Clayton was doing. And Superfund was another party that was like downtown Chicago, but it was a lot of like the creatives, like Virgil and them kind of started, like Virgil Abloh and Don C and Ivan. Um, I think even like Lupe were down there in the beginning. They're the ones that kind of infused that brand with the cosign that had that brand go to the next level. But they did a good job at documenting these community-based like events and, and shooting them across the world. I just did an art show in Hawaii, and some random dude came up to me and was like, oh man, like, I had a brand called Enswell Corp. It's like, oh man, you own Enswell Corp? Like, I know about that brand because I used to see your videos online. And when I remember Superfund, and he was talking to me about all of this stuff in Chicago, like super excited about what we were doing all the way in Chicago from Hawaii. But at that time, we had no idea that this was really going on. We knew people liked it, but to know people were basing their inspiration off of the stuff that we had was like incredible, right? So um, from Hope, it kind of evolved into like even more and more photographic images. You start to see the evolution of the work, right? This was the second piece I did with him. This was like a vinyl. It came out on vinyl. Um, and it was the same thing, man, just taking photos, taking inspiration, and creating it. But you can see a theme from this even to like the chance work. I would use this in self-portraits a lot. Like a lot of these, these works derive from this self-portrait series that I've been working on since I was like 12, that I would, you know, um, use the same composition or similar composition in different environments to kind of create a mood and create a feeling around somebody, right? Um, and this was the last piece that we did. This is the first time I did like a digital painting type of thing for, for an artist. And it worked really well together, right? Because, and it starts, it like tells a story, right? It connects all of these, these pieces together, even the colors. You know, I started to draw from these, I went from these solid colors to these gradients. And then I even like went harder with the gradients on the lines. I like I had to level up every time, right? Um, so yeah, that was that work. Here's another piece that I did for a band called Christian Rich. They're a um, producer duo, but they also like performing artists, and they they're working with Pharrell at, at the time. So like this was the first time I really got a lot of publicity, right? Um, it was a great event and a great time for me because it was the first time you know I seen my work to that capacity. I really realized the value, but this was difficult for me because these characters were the characters that I used to draw to kind of deal with my personal stuff. So to have somebody tell you, give you direction around something so personal was just difficult for me, right? Because these kind of like had a, a significant meaning beyond that. And I never intended for this to be a commercial, these things to be a commercial piece of work at the time. This one time I was in a high park and I was hanging out with my friend Aja Monet. I met her at my friend Rob Swayze's studio. Just random day. Um, we were just talking in his, in his studio and there's this kid who was asleep on the couch uh, just knocked out, um, had this bandage around his arm. And I didn't think much of it. But um, as we kept talking and like we you know, kept being in conversation, they started talking about like album art. And uh, this kid ended up saying like, oh man, you, have you seen this, this band? It's, they call it Christian Rich. They had this album cover called The Decadence. Uh, some, some dude did it. I don't know where he's from. I'm, I'm not sure. Like, you know, but I want dude to do my work. Like, it's the craziest thing. I ever seen, and I'm like, yo, man, I, I did that. And it was just the weirdest <laughs> feeling to me, man. It was like, damn, like, this is crazy. In the room with me at that time, and that kid is Vic Mensa. This is when I first met Vic. This was right after he got electrocuted, after he tried to jump the fence at Lollapalooza, <laughs> right? That's why he was asleep on the couch, because he was tired. He just came out of the hospital, and electricity shot out of his arm, and he had a big bandage on it. It was crazy. Um, so yeah, that's the a, that's a story behind that piece, man. Um, one of my favorite pieces. Uh, it was a really good color study. Well, at least that's an important thing to me, like colors for moods, right? Being able to convey so many different things or lead people on the journey with so much information, because it's a lot of info, right? And color stories is kind of what I want to get into next, and specifically with the chance work. It was the first time that project by project, we got a chance to really deal with a mood for the moment and have like that vibe convey the concept that that album, but have the consistency be there so it's like unmistakable, all right? So for this talk, I did like a, how you say it? I did like a slim down or like simplified version of all of the cover art and all of the pieces that I did for it. I feel like one of the main things about the pieces that folks remember are the colors and not necessarily like all the details, right? It's like, it's like it, it, this, this chemistry so it can be stripped down in a sense. I had like all of these ideas about what I was gonna do 
with the 10-day cover, and, and that was supposed to be like these things that he was thinking kind of coming out of his mind, right? Like all of these, this extra shit that I was just like, oh, I got to do this. This is the first time I've done anything like this, um, you know, like digital work or whatever. First time. So I had all these ideas of stuff I wanted to do, and then it came to like the night before the event, and Chance is freaking out, and his manager is freaking out, and I'm in a process like, man, it's, it's boiling though, bro. You cannot force the, the process, man, you know what I mean? We cooking, and it's just like, it, uh, it, it ended up getting to the point where um, it was like seven in the morning, and I kind of had to improvise the clouds, but I always like use clouds in my work, so it was just like, it kind of perfectly laid up to be these elements that kind of spoke to my, my DNA. The, uh, the tag, straight from out of the comic book vibe, right? With the name, um, the guy looking up, I've drawn self-portraits in that position, like, you know, so, like so many times. Uh, and then I had to create a quick fix for the type. It kind of just came together, right? The day of the event, the day of the drop. And the music was like great. And of course the goal with this was to present the work in such a way that makes it stand out on a blog so people can't, so you can't deny it, right? And I think that's, that's really important. It's like overconsumption is like an oversaturation of a lot of things. And you, we have to figure out ways to be creative about our approach and our presentation of ourselves and the things we put out. And I think it's just really important to kind of like draw from your personal experiences. That's why I went back to like the comics and the other interests to bring that stuff forward in a way that allowed the artwork to move forward on these blogs and on these posts so people couldn't pass it. The first time I met Donald Glover, he's like, oh man, dude, that's, that's why I would listen to the album. The first time I met a lot of, a lot of radio DJs, dude, that's why. And that was the point, and not, you know, not to say anything other than that, that's what you create the work for. So if you're not doing that, you know, you're doing yourself a disservice and you're doing the artist a disservice, right? Because he may have something that people actually relate to and really want to hear. But if the presentation isn't right and ca doesn't catch people off guard, yeah, it may, that may not ever happen. So this was the second one. This was really crazy because I was just, for one, I was just like impressed about the progression, the progression from like one project to the next, right? So this sound was like, I feel like a lot more mature. When I heard Acid Rain, I was like, damn, this is like some serious, some serious shit. He went from this high school kid to really talking about these this super introspective, super deep subject matter and uh, way of dealing with it. So what was crazy was that we were down in South by Southwest, and um, it was the year that we did these tank tops. I did, I did like a bunch of these tank tops. I dyed them at, um, at, at a School of the Arts Institute, actually. I wanted to dye some tank tops like myself, like hand dye them, because like, people were crazy into the tank top things. I was like, I don't want the same colors as everybody. I got to do this myself, you know, <laughs> like me taking a super hard route. Like, but while I was at South by Southwest, of course, I was like gifting people these tanks and, and, and stuff like that. And on the way down to 6th Street one day, when we were in a car, we were riding down to 6th Street, uh, my friend Roger Tino, uh, Roger Tino Morales, he, uh, he pulled up OJ, uh, OJ, damn, OJ Hayes' video of a uh, good ass intro. It was like the first video from the project. And man, to see the, the, the sort of like reverberation of like the inspiration, was dope to me. Like we put, a, we put out this project, the first one, or the artwork, whatever, and it, and it started to reverberate. So the identity, like his logo started to reflect this vibe. So his logo became the head. These ideas began, began to kind of speak for the brand, right? And when I saw OJ's video and he took it to the next level, he animated the head, like spinning in 360, and he was doing all these other things, it was like, damn, that's inspiring to me, and that makes me want to do this again. I was inspired at first because I heard the music and I recognized it was different than something else. But at that moment, I claimed, I was like, yo, I have to do this. I have to do this second piece. I have to do the second album because it's, it's just dope. Like, it's a conversation now. You know what I'm saying? Like, if, with everybody else too, because fans were making fan art, all of this stuff. So anyway, um, yeah, we, I ended up taking this photo, on, a photo of him on my phone with him and my business partner. It's him in the same expression, but his body was a little different because he, he had his arm around my business partner or whatever. But it just so happened that the tank top colors matched the light in the room, and the light in the room, uh, everything vibed, and then it also matched a sunset backdrop that I can kind of pull together. And this whole idea of astrology 
this whole idea of like the, the presentation of this is like, you know, he, he's a microcosm of the universe at large, like behind him, right? His name is in the stars. It, it's kind of like prophecy in a way, or like foretelling something. Um, at first, we didn't want to go with this one because the expression was so weird. Uh, he wanted to do a nicer photo, but then we, you know, we decided like this is perfect for like acid rap. It's a kid experimenting with drugs, not knowing how he's feeling right now, kind of freaking out, kind of happy, kind of like, what is going on, right? So it works. It works. Um, and then there's the last piece. Last piece, of course, was coloring book. And you know, man, this is another one that was like, was super crazy. Um, was crazy. I didn't know if we were going to really be working together on this, this capacity again because it just got huge, <laughs> like, after that's a rap, it was, and it was like three years since the last tape that came out, so I wasn't sure, but man, that moment on uh, Saturday Night Live when they were doing ultralight beams, if you go back and you look at that clip, it's pretty much exactly a very similar to how the cover is. The moment I saw it on TV, I saw it, you know what I mean, like, this is it, this is the third, you know, the third joint, and, um, on television, you, there's like pink, they're like pinker clouds, but they were lit with blue, and the background was warm, basically, all right? And that's what Chance kind of wanted to do, flip-flop the first vibe, the red and blue, and, and kind of swap it, but have the red be more like an like a orange tint, so it wasn't like su super patriotic, basically. That's what we're trying to get away from. And uh, yeah, man, it worked. It worked. And uh, yeah, I guess that's all I have to say about, about this piece, man. I, I like, I'm a, I, I think they get better as time goes on, and they kind of speak even more and more to, to um, this artist's trajectory. So in the last one, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, like, the spiritual concepts or like, aspects of these things uh, now, and numerology and astrology. Like I've, I've just kind of like, am now really paying a lot of attention in how I operate and really considering and looking into astrology and numerology. I know it might seem like hocus pocus to a lot of people, but I think there's um, a lot to gain. And I think there's some like some, yeah, I think, I, I think it's pretty dope. Anyway, um, so in this one, we were trying to like just foretell sort of like future ideas with the astrology or whatever in the, in the sky. And this one, I kind of like, we worked in numerology and I was trying to figure out a way to put 33 stars in the sky because like 33 is his life, his life path, right? So it wasn't quite working out with what I had ended up doing. I had to crop it down, I had to do a couple other things, I didn't have time. But that logo was like a Sox logo before it was the three. And this was before like the idea of the hats and stuff were kind of born. And my, my suggestion was like not to do tight. Like we stripping down, like everyone, we get doper, but we strip down a little bit. His name's there, his name's not there, the title's there. And now there's no type, and it's just the piece. And it's, 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 you're just confronted with him and the emotion. So the three like, became the way to kind of fit that in, that numerology aspect of it. Um, I did end up putting like 33 in the sky here. Um, some of them did get cropped though, but the three has an outline, and that was kind of my way of like nodding to that, nodding to his personal journey, his personal path, who he is, and where he's going with his work. So in this one, I kind of tried to duplicate it here. It's 33 stars in the, in the sky over here to kind of recreate that in the way that I would have had it in the, you know, <laughs> the uh, final version of this. So those are the pieces on that. I mean, beyond this, we've done other things. We've done other prints and just tried to, tried to stay really consistent with the brand. Anybody can create merch, you know, print of a bunch of shit. Anybody can like do that type of stuff. But I think when you do things uh, you take them a little bit step further, you stand to stand out a lot more and be a lot more effective in your you know, future, future endeavors and everything else because it opens up a lot, a lot of things for you. Then you start opening yourself up to other industries. And you know, like recording artists are artists, of course, but like the art world and like the music industry are like two different things, you know what I mean? And like even, even that and sequential artists or like graphic novel artists versus like art world. That's a whole different thing. And my goal is, <clears throat> is to strip down the barriers between all of it. The only way I was able to really do all this stuff because we didn't have a label to like be telling people how to spend their money and to tell people cert certain things. 
So I like this era is very important in that artists are beginning to own the industries in which um, kind of made billions off of them, you know? Uh, put them in like serious, crazy labor conditions and not paid them that much in a lot of people's cases. So yeah, that's, that's what I think this stands for. That's what I think this work stands for. And then myself as an artist, you know, I want to, to uh, break down those, those barriers to create new things all the time. Um, this was a collaboration with Stussy and Treated Crew. Worked on a lot of these pieces with my friend Mano. These two pieces are, um, anybody look at uh, anime? Y'all know about uh, Evangelion? Anybody? Evangelion was the first um, animated film, anime piece, that I saw series incomplete, right? Like, I was at Gallery 37. Gallery 37 was like, it used to be outside. It used to be outdoors downtown. You know where Block 37, where they build all that stuff? They used to be gone, and there were tents there. And at the tents, kids just created art all day long. And then they auctioned your art off in a store, but they paid you like minimum wage to like, you know, to like work, to like make art and stuff. So when I was down there, I was meeting all of these, these, these kids, all these black nerds and shit, like all kind of stuff, and these anime heads. And the anime heads um, kind of put me on to like Evangelion and a lot of different anime. Just kind of blew my mind, like this type of stuff is not supposed to be coming from cartoons, period. That's how I felt. Um, and like this is a, a part of my practice too, in my oils, is incorporating the uh, artwork into like physical items that exist so that like the item is a part of the work in a way. And this is like Chance's Goku. That's why he's, he's like riding Nimbus or whatever. Uh, this was uh, Devil Man is the anime that kind of did inspire this piece. And he's wearing a sweatshirt, of course, that I'm wearing. And that's Dugan. That's Dugan right there, my friend. Yeah, these pieces. Uh, poems by Esker Johnson, um, collages by Dugan Kim. Uh, another piece, it's like eight foot by eight foot uh, interference. I was working with uh, trying to express fear in, uh, in, the, in the figure, in the subject, and that was more so that like, that uh, trying to like identify or create a visual language to like intangible emotions or like feelings. The one on the right is an oil, oil painting I did that came from um, a found image study. Like I was doing a series of found images for a while online where I would just like, take down cool images and like, and do like this face paint type of thing on it. Um, here's some more of those. It's just fun, it's fun to do. And then that's the Instagram and the Twitter. And that's it. Thank you, appreciate it. Man. Uh, so, question time. Um, uh, Brian, in the back. Uh, what was the uh, reference story behind uh, Color Story? Uh, the color, we did a shoot. Like, I think Chance posted like the original images of like those other two covers a little bit ago. Um, it's always fun for people to see that type of stuff, because then you can get more of a context for what was going on in that, that day, and it, it feels like a day all of a sudden, instead of like this intangible like moment, this crazy moment. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, I don't have any right now, but we did a shoot at my friend Mark Moran's studio in the West Loop for that cover. So, are you purposely not speaking to the third cover and going this kid? Oh, no, nah, it's just a lot of stuff, man. It's just a lot of stuff. It's a lot, it's a lot of stuff, and then too, like, um, man, sometimes I forget that, like, Everyone's not thinking the exact same thing I'm thinking at every moment. No. <laughs> no, like for real though, because I forget, like it was in an article. Somebody put it out in an article a minute ago. Um, when I was doing an article for Pigeons and Planes, they asked me, why is he looking down? A lot of people were, you know, they had all of these crazy uh, theories about like why the different perspectives, why he's looking different ways. And he was holding his daughter. He wanted to capture the expression on his face um, when he was holding his daughter in his arms, which was great because it allowed us to kind of have people be able to build a story about the previous work since he was looking in a different direction and it like it was that piece that people kind of flipped out over some dude like did a his own version of it like painted it online and was like going ham with it like mention me mention me mention me he was like <laughs> he was going nuts it was funny go ahead okay, yeah i was gonna say in the uh in the first one chance is looking up yeah yeah 
Yeah. See, there we go. There we go. Uh, I mean, it, it was done in purpose. It was done on purpose so much as the universe designed it. That's all I can really say, to be for real. Because, like, it, it naturally showed that progression. And in the first one, I was trying to convey him looking up to something, like, massive. Like, when you when you 18, I was really just trying to convey the emotions that he was giving off on this album. When you 18, getting it suspended is like a big thing. You know what I mean? In this world that you're stepping into, and even turning that into an opportunity to make a mixtape is a big thing. It's like a huge thing. Everything seems so much larger than it is, right? And then in the second one, it was experimentation. It was kind of confusing. And he's direct, He's like breaking the third wall. He's looking directly at the audience in that one, like self-reflecting. It's almost as if it's a mirror, right, when you're looking at the piece. And then in the last one, it's, it's like this calm, this sense of like environment. His focus is not so much on himself, the mirror, but his, the future. You know what I mean? Um, Thank you, Brendan, for the presentation. My question is, um, with the new political climate, do you see yourself creating art to express um, your opinion or like support to a certain group? Uh, meaning, like, how does art intersect with what's going on in the world today, and how do you express that through your art? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think that's a good question. You know, I think a lot of people will choose to express themselves in different way, ways to uh, against what's going on in the world and to like to address what's going on into the world. And I really support that. I mean, even if we don't agree the same way and we don't agree to do things the same way, that's OK, because your expression is, is important and it's a part of the equation. And um, I, I think it's important for people to do what's on their heart, what's in their heart. And for me, uh, I like to think about the future. I like to create things for the future, new avenues, like literally create worlds, or like, you know, that's, that's, I'm focused on world building right now. Um, the protesting thing is not, that's just not my approach. I get it, you know what I'm saying, I understand that, but it's just not my approach. Um, and that's okay, man, I, you know, I've, I've often had my own point of view on things and needed to travel my own path to see where it, where it will open up for me. So for me, man, it's just like creating great stuff, man, like doing, like, I'm, I'm about to like direct this series for PBS soon, and it's about education. So that's like dope, you know what I'm saying? Like doing things to build the future and build these ideas for the future. I don't want to be mad at nobody, like, you know? I don't want to be sick for. Twan. What was the experience with the end of the court during and after the conference? You said beginning and after? Yeah. Oh man, that was crazy, man. It was a. Uh, it was crazy, man. It was, uh... okay, I started doing shirts because I wanted to put art on tees. And, and what I found out is, like, through streetwear, these avenues and streetwear, like, consumption, it was cool. It was, like, it, was, it was sort of the main thing. So what I found was, like, I would put these, I, what I thought were, like, really interesting, like, you know, I said, I said like, they were whack. People, people thought that, too, that they were good. But, uh... It, it kind of devalued it in a sense when I would put art on, on shirts first. And that, and that was in that time, in that era. Like, you know, I think you can, uh, I think a lot of people have shown better ways of doing it, like, like now or whatever. But I just didn't like the idea of something being easily repeated and then um, also potentially ending up in a landfill somewhere. Like, I don't want to make art that becomes trash and that gets discarded and that creates clutter. And I, I don't know, I just feel like, I, if I had to sell a, a thousand t-shirts to be rich or whatever, like 75% of them gonna end up in a you know, thrift store in a landfill somewhere. I don't know, that's just, that's just kind of how I thought about it, man. It just didn't feel fulfilling. It just didn't, it just didn't feel fulfilling. So um, that's sort of why I, like, I kind of stepped out. Karma Loop was like the era when we were really trying to hit people with the trends. We were really trying to like, you know, spark that in people. And it was working, man. Like Karma Loop, I mean, it's, it's equivalent to how much effort you put into it. You got all these people looking at your stuff. If it's halfway decent, people are going to buy it. But it just was not, I feel like, worth the hole in my soul. <laughs> I'm joking. But yeah. Uh, after, after Karma Loop, it was like uh, we tried to, we, we were focusing more so on more conceptual things, of course. We kind of got back to core. I needed to end the, we needed to end the brand in a way that I felt like spoke to um, kind of like what we were 
really doing and circle back to the original intent of it. And I think we did that with the last collection. Yep. I was gonna say, one, how long does it usually take you to like draw your art pieces? Yeah. And, and then two, considering like Chance's current like status in the game, if you had the opportunity to do a fourth cover, what would you like do with it? I can't tell you that though. <laughs> okay. I can't tell you what I'm gonna do. I already know what I'm gonna do. No, I'm just joking. Uh, um, I would definitely do it again because I think it's a, it's a growing relationship. I mean, I value, I value people um, who continue to work with a consistent body of folks. I mean, that's not everybody's thing. Like David Bowie, David Bowie is like one of my favorite artists ever, right? Um, he almost shape-shifted every time he did a different project. You know, he was his character and it was dope because it worked for you know, what Bowie was doing, right? these different phases of, of, of man, of himself. Prince like, had a band for a while, right? And kind of morph and kind of do his own thing. Um, but, and then there's some people that work with people consistently throughout their career. I just think that's, I wish Michael Jackson would have kept working with Quincy Jones. You know what I'm saying? Like, because I, I think with, with Off the Wall and Thriller, they had a real good vibe going. Um, so I like that aspect of, of being able to do that. And I'm more than, than open to do that because that helps me expand my practice and grow my practice. And it helps me do stuff for other artists, too. Because I feel like these are some of the first times like, artists have getting that much recognition for like, album art and getting like, articles and fate. Like, I was surprised. That's, all, that's what I wanted all along, because my whole idea was like, yo, visual artists do not get enough love and like, credit. And now we've inspired a lot of kids to want it. Oh, my mic, did it just go out? Just tweak. Oh, OK. And now I feel like we've, we've inspired like a lot of kids to kind of want to do album covers you know, for a living. And I got to make it my responsibility to make sure they can eat off of just doing album covers for a living. So you know, with the new projects, finding new structures that work, that are sustainable, where you can actually do that work, and you don't have to sign the rights of it all the way. And we can, you know, you can kind of do some type of ro royalty agreements. But it might take a while, especially um, if it's coming from an independent sector, because all of those expenses on of the burden, they're on that artist and that, on that artist's team. It's difficult. It's difficult. White shirt. What are some things that you do to get past creative blocks? Um, that's a, a good question. Man, meditate, usually. Like, I, I'm, uh, I believe the answers will find me when I shut up and let them find me. Like honestly, so like a lot of times just sleeping on things and not freaking out um, really gives me so I, I just did a project. I just I was just a project for a national beverage company, like alcoholic beverage company. There gonna be um, bottles all over the city this summer, right? And I couldn't figure it out, man. I was like, dude, for like three or four days, I'm like tripping, like, how do I wrap my mind literally around this bottle, right? But but, uh, but it was just just trying to figure it out, man. It was just like sometimes when there's too many variables with something it's difficult for you to even address it, like see it, approach it, whatever. So I think one of the things I, I kind of use is I try to cut out the variables as much as I can. So I got to the point where like, okay, I have to illustrate this bottle out and actually draw on the bottle. And if I needed to grab a Sharpie and actually draw on the bottle, then that's what I would have needed to do. But I think when you cut out as many variables in, in the process, you can kind of see uh, like home base, uh, however you say. Um, that helps me a lot. Of course, like inspiration, like looking at other things, um, and gathering, not just looking for things and ripping it off, but gathering intel and ideas and allowing your mind to travel when you see somebody else's work, when you see other inspiration. I think that's important to, to make it better, to create, to make it better. And that's like, when we were breaking, that's what we were doing. And I, the foundation of all of that stuff came when I was b-boying. Because when we were breaking, it was like, you can't bite, but if you make it better, I can't say shit. You know what I mean? Like, if you make what I did. So, you know, approaching inspiration in that way, I think, Helps with creative blocks and just uh, trust in, in what you what you do. I feel like my work has been a lot of places right now. I'm not so I'm not I'm pretty confident that it can be more places or as you know as distributed as it has been. So yeah, man, I'm I'm fortunate enough for that. And I feel like a lot of this stuff was like luck or like the universe, or what you could say, that kind of like got me in these positions. But I'm grateful. Go ahead. Hey, I'm Kayla. Hello. Um, can you talk about how you, you said like the universe and stuff, but can you talk about how you found God through your art? Oh, 
Man, that's a, oh man, another story, story time. Okay, so um, I'm trying to make it quick too. So for me, man, that's a good one. So that, that trip to, okay, so that collection I showed was um, inspired by this trip I took to Japan, 2005, through DePaul actually. And that trip, we were studying the impact of the atomic bomb on Japanese society. And at the time in my life, I was dealing with um, confronting my faith. One of my friends who I went to high school with, he, used to, he, he was like a Hebrew Israelite like two months prior, but he flipped atheist and like, it like shook a lot of things for me because he was a close friend of mine. And um, like, it was just, he got real cynical all of a sudden. And a lot of it like was, felt like intrusive into my, my faith and my belief system, but I had to seriously question the details of what I believed because somebody for the first time was like asking me, why? You know, they were like really, they were really probing and a lot of those things I didn't necessarily have answers to. So on my trip to Japan, my whole goal was try to, I wanted to find God, I wanted to, you know, figure out, you know, what that was. And I say throughout the, the experience and being there, I found a solution I like I found sort of sort of um, my answer what I was was looking for and what it was is I think that force of, the force of creativity is the interconnectedness between us and everything in our world um, other people uh, other forms of life just how so int how intricately woven we are together is a force within itself and um, ask questions you don't think to ask, give you answers that sometimes you might not be ready for, but that set you straight and like set you up in these crazy places when you didn't even think it was possible. So for, for me through that, that's kind of like how I look. And I try to be, I try to pull at that every time I create a piece and like pull that mysticism out because I, you know, I think, I don't think it's fake. I think it's real. Two more questions for Ben. Thank you. Yeah, is there any advice that you would just give to like to us or to whoever's trying to like go into that media industry? Yeah. Like how like is there a certain trait that you would tell people to go after? I mean obviously there's a mix of things. Yeah. Well, uh huh. I go I go back to that piece where I was talking about um, the job you work, it is the place you work or wherever you choose to be employed at or chooses you as an employee, it's not their job to fulfill you. You have to find that on your own. Um, if you go out with that intention, um, you might get disappointed. I see a lot of adults in agencies and stuff, ad agencies everywhere that complain all day and, and like, you know, resigned. They're being underserved by their bosses because their bosses feel the exact same way they feel, but just at a different position, pay grade, right? So um, I think really finding out what that is for you on the side and making it work, realizing your job is your job, it isn't their job to fulfill you. But for you to do that and be good at it and be effective, you have to care. But you can also have your own thing that feeds you, your soul. And if you choose to go into that and do that solely, then that, that's your choice, right? The other, other piece of advice I give is like, um, you don't get what you deserve you get what you negotiate, right? So a lot of us you know, feel like we've a lot of times put out a lot of effort, a lot of work, and we deserve more, we deserve this and this and that. But in business, with people in this creative field, wherever you are, you get what you negotiate. I negotiate with everybody that reaches out to me to do some work. I'm pushing the budget up, you know what I'm saying? And I'm, cause I'm, that's what I have to do you know, for myself. So um, I think those, those two things. And Do you find yourself, or have you find yourself often in the same situation, like with acid rap and coloring book and all that, artists reaching out to you for the same kind of style? Yeah. And how do you deal with those situations in a way to a not pour out your your look and yeah. you know not making it so accessible to just anybody with bread that can come and do it? Like, yeah. How do you preserve at least the art perspective? Of it? versus compromising to the financial end because it's in style at the time. Mm -hmm.
That's a good question. Um, thought about that a whole lot, man. So what I would say to that is before what I would do, I just wouldn't make myself available for work because that work and like the effort of work I was putting in, the effort of time, from what I would get with an ad agency versus what people like had for a budget to pay me was just inc incomparable. You know, so a lot of those projects I did believing in them beyond what they were and because my soul was in that place. And everybody that comes and presents work to you, you may not feel like that, you know? And I wasn't, I wasn't feeling like that in those situations. Um, so for a while I was kind of like turning work down, but I, I, I got that I'm not only doing this to be an artist, I'm also doing this to be a businessman. So I had to ask myself, under what conditions am I willing to take on extra work? Really define it. What's the starting cost of that work? What does it involve? What's my role? Am I creative director? Am I art director? Am I doing some other thing around it? Because if not, I'm just leaving the money on the table. When people are looking for help and guidance to establish their brands, there's power in that. You know? And it's easy to kind of walk away like, nah, I don't want to do your beats and shut, shut off. But you know, um, I, I, I try to open myself up. And I'm just now starting to open up the doors, even, like, even, like just the space in my mind to like, yo, we need to manage this and care about this just as much as all of these other projects, working with other artists and stuff and, and doing things like that. So um, that's how I found like, my answer for that.